Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Northern Light Health Good Health is Good Business Zoom conference. Thanks to the COVID-19 Delta variant, to quote Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. We find ourselves once again masking, physical distancing, hand washing, and keeping close track of vaccination rates, new daily cases, hospitalizations, ICU occupancy, ventilator use, and deaths. Today's topics will include latest on COVID-19 focusing on the Delta variant, updates on safety precautions for return to school, information on vaccines, and supporting our mental health. I'm Dr. Ed Gilkey, Senior Physician Executive at Northern Light Beacon Health. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. Our panelists today are Dr. Amy Belisle, Chief Pediatrician and Chief Child Health Officer for the State of Maine Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Elizabeth Marnick, Assistant Professor of Molecular Biochemistry at Husson University, Angela Felicia, Director of Healthy Life Resources Program at Northern Light Acadia, Dr. Jim Jarvis, Director of Clinical Education at Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center and Physician Leader for Vaccinations and COVID-19 Incident Command at Northern Light Health. Before we get started, I will read out legal disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon Northern Light Health's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation and which may be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you, your employees, and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. A reminder, this hour is for you. If at any time you have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. I'll keep track of your questions and have our speakers respond. Also, I hope each of you take a few minutes immediately following this hour to answer our quick five question survey. Your input directly affects our topics and helps guide our future conferences. Dr. Jarvis will start us off with a COVID-19 update. Jim? Thank you, Ed. Um, next slide, please. So really want to talk about the Delta variant because that's really what we're talking about now. Um, the Delta variant, in my opinion, should be treated just as if it was a brand new virus and, and not that this is the same coronavirus um, we have seen before. Uh, this is just a population map of the United States of cases that we've set, that cumulative cases. And you can see that there are many regions of the country that are now a deep, deep, dark red. Um, and in Maine, we have a smattering of that. Um, and so it's cause for concern. The Delta, variant, the, the Delta variant is at least two times more infectious than we've seen with either the Alpha variant or the original strain of the coronavirus COVID-19. At this time, we don't know if it's causing more severe disease, but it is certainly because of more people being infected. We've seen a dramatic increase in the rate of hospitalizations across the country and here in Maine as well. And in fact, community spread continues to rise uh, here in the state of Maine, with yesterday our percent positivity rate for Northern Light Health Labs uh, topping 7% um, for, the last, for the last week, and actually over 6.5% for the, for the previous two weeks. And so this is a slide just kind of indicating that, that this is kind of going up. Um, the dramatic issue here is that we put this slide together on Monday, today's only Wednesday, uh, and we've seen a dramatic rise even in just those two days. Um, you can see also, by looking at the lower portion of the graph, this isn't just because there's just a small amount of tests being done. We're actually seeing an, a large increase in the tests being performed with a significant increase in the number of those being positive. Next slide, please. So this is a, the, the slide that worries me the most. And so this is from um, the Mayo Clinic, and there's a link there that can actually take you to the tracking trends. And you can see that back on June 15th, uh, most of the state of Maine was yellow. You can see Piscataquis County was a little bit orange. Just a few short weeks later, you can see that today uh, we, are more, we are more red than we are um, any other color with some uh, smatterings of uh, dark purple. Each of those indicates just more of a, a percent population of 100,000 that are um, now infected. 
And then you look at what the prediction is for just a couple of weeks from now, and you can see that, that the situation becomes even more grave, where now we no longer have anybody in, orange, in yellow. We only have one county in orange, and most of the counties now are red or deep red. That's a trend that we need to stop, and really is what we what we well talking about today is how we can kind of mitigate some of that spread, um, and the importance of all the things that we've been talking about of late, particularly anyone who's eligible for a vaccine, get vaccinated if you're not vaccinated, making sure that you're continuing to do good hand hygiene, um, remaining physically distanced when appropriate, and then um, following the CDC's guidance that in any county that has substantial or high spread of disease, which is all but I think one or two counties now in the state of Maine, should be wearing masks indoors regardless of vaccination status. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the Delta variant in our kids. Right now, kids under 18 uh, represent, there's about 1,900 of them who are currently hospitalized in the U.S., and each day that is going up higher and higher. In Maine, 20% of our positive cases now are in people under the age of 20. And in fact, Maine is now uh, the uh, ranks fourth in the entire country of the percent of positive cases being children. Our percentage rate is somewhere between 18 and 20 percent, and that is much higher than the national average of 14.4 percent. Some of that has to do with the fact that we did very well with vaccinating our adults, and so there's a little bit of statistical um, math there that makes it so that children would make up that larger percentage, but a lot of it is that we're seeing spread to our kids right now. So it is very important that we talk about masking, because masking has been shown when added to those other preventative measures to prevent the spread, and very important with the Delta variant. Next slide, please. So let's talk about booster shots. So uh, there was an update actually since the first time I made the slides, and so we redid those slides. Um, so we redid those slides recently, and uh, this is what we know right now. Um, there's currently talk about boosters uh, and, um, and, boost and additional doses. Those only apply to people who have received the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. That's the mRNA vaccine. Um, yesterday, it was announced by the federal government that they're working towards a plan to offer booster do doses in mid to late September. Their goal is to start on September 20th. Here's some things to understand. First and foremost, that will only happen after there is full um, agreement by the FDA and the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, who we've talked about before. Um, once they, they uh, um, agree, then they will put this plan in place. They should begin only to no earlier than people um, who received their last dose of the primary series eight months before. So really that we're talking about ind individuals who are first responders, healthcare workers, and a few other individuals who got their vaccine back in December and January. But slowly we'll see that as we get through everything um, around uh, adding to, to everybody else. Uh, we may hear more about Johnson & Johnson later, but right now there is no recommendation for Johnson & Johnson to get a booster shot. I've been asked about this, like, why is that? Is it because Johnson & Johnson is better or anything along those lines? And no, it's just that we don't have any data to support doing that for Johnson & Johnson like we do with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. The other thing to remember is this does not mean that the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines aren't working or stopped working. What it means is, is that we know that, that immunity to coronaviruses tend to wane over time. Coronaviruses make up about 60% of, of all colds, and therefore we know that we get reinfected with coronaviruses over and over again during our lifetime because we don't uh, have long-term immunity to it. So it's no surprise that immunity will wane, but truthfully, the immunity for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are still higher than we expect with any vaccine. They are just so superior to previous vaccines that uh, this is just a precautionary measure. And I will say that Northern Light and the state are already discussing for plans on how to roll that out in Maine. I see some questions about immunocompromised, and I believe that's our next slide. So let's talk about the, uh, what's re currently recommended for additional doses for people who are immunocompromised. Again, this would be a third dose of either the Pfizer or the Moderna. It does not apply to people who received Johnson & Johnson vaccine as their primary series. And these are the following conditions that currently are under the guidance of severe immunocompromised conditions. It's people who are currently undergoing active treatment for solid tumor or blood cancers. Individuals who have received a solid organ transplant and are currently taking immunosuppressant therapy because of that organ transplant. People who have received certain cell um, transplants, including stem tr cell transplants, and it, it, if they've received that within the last two years or they received it more than two years ago and they are currently taking immunosuppressive therapy because of that transplant. People who are in active treatment with high dose corticosteroids. So, this is not that your doctor gave you a dose of as you, um, you know, had a COPD exacerbation or something along those lines. This is people who are taking steroids on a daily basis at a very high dose. 
um, over a prolonged period of time. And then certain other medications that uh, I won't go into the specifics of, uh, suffice to say that you really need to consult with your physician if you think that you are taking an immunosuppressive drug um, that may qualify you for, for a third dose of either Pfizer or Moderna. And then lastly, it's people with advanced or untreated HIV infection. And that's a pretty uh, um, small population uh, here in the state of Maine as most of the patients with HIV are managed very, very well. And then, like I said, individuals should uh, consult with their physician. And, and really, I think that's important because especially for those people who are under treatment, they may actually need to alter their treatment schedule in order to get the vaccine to have its full efficacy. And so just showing up at a pharmacy and saying, hey, listen, I think I qualify for that third dose. Can you give it to me? May not be in your best interest because you do need to make sure um, that you don't need to have your other medications adjusted when you get that vaccine. And I believe that's my last slide and I'll turn it back over to Ed. So oh, thanks, Jim. So uh, let me just uh, clarify a piece. So um, the eight months that we're talking about going forward are for everyone other than immunocompromised, uh, you know, as we roll out boosters. Uh, for the immunocompromised, the take-home messages speak to your physician, and they may decide that shorter than eight months would be appropriate. Absolutely, Ed. In fact, the, the for immunocompromised individuals that meet that small classification there, it's 28 days after their last, the, the last dose of the original series. So if it's been 28 days since they got their second dose, then they're eligible for their third. That's why I like to call it an additional dose rather than a booster, because it's really part of their primary series mm. of vaccine rather than a booster shot, which, you, you know, usually we talk about booster shots coming af later after you've uh, finished your primary series. So that's kind of the difference there. A little nuance, hard to pull that, pull that out in the media. Again, why it's important to consult with your provider. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jim, for that clarification. So next up is Dr. Belisle, who will further develop COVID-19 information, youth, and vaccines. Amy? Thank you very much, Dr. Jarvis and Dr. Gilkey. And thank you everyone for inviting me to talk to you today. First, I just wanna highlight some of the data that we're seeing in Maine that Dr. Jarvis alluded to earlier around children and COVID-19. There is on the Maine CDC website information that's updated every two weeks that has quite detailed information around children with COVID disease in the state. As of last week, about 17% of the cases were under the age of 18. And we do publish the number of hospitalizations of children under the age of 25. So there were 49 as of last week. This number has started to increase over the last week. So we are watching that closely. And in this data, there is also information from the case report. So it shows symptoms of children that have had COVID and it provides much more detailed information that may be helpful for the general public and also for medical providers who are um, assessing children with COVID-19 symptoms. You can go to the next slide. So today we're gonna to talk about the Maine CDC's response to the US CDC guidelines for K-12 schools and the recommendations that have been provided for Maine DHHS Department of Education in the state. We are asking schools to follow the US CDC's guidance on um, schools that was issued in mid-July. Part of that is recommendations around universal masking for all students and staff that gather in person in the classrooms. This is especially important, as Dr. Jarvis is saying, with the increase of the Delta variant. And additionally, all students on buses and vans and school-provided transports will need to wear masks. This is the same as last year in the state. There's been no change there. The exciting part for us is that vaccines have been available in the state and teachers and school staff were prioritized for vaccines in March. And our hope is to encourage vaccination of all eligible students over the age of 12 and staff to get COVID vaccine. Not only everyone that works in the school, but everybody in the surrounding community to support the schools and make sure that they can gather in person safely. And the US CDC also strongly recommends testing in the state. We have a pooled testing program, which I'll talk about in a minute as well as testing for symptomatic individuals. And they were also encouraging masking and physical distancing when possible. You can go to the next slide. There is very detailed guidance on the Department of Education's website. There is a COVID-19 toolkit, which is updated probably on a daily basis right now with additional information that the Department of Education has been highlighting around uh, mitigation tools for COVID-19. Um, we also, like I said, refer people back to the federal CDC guidance that was updated back in July. And the main CDC is working closely with the Department of Education on what we call a standard operating procedure for positive cases in schools. 
This was really just updated in the past week. It gets updated every so often by the main CDC. The biggest updates in the past week were around quarantine. So if schools have certain things in place, like masking, like pool testing, it will limit the number of people, uh, both staff and students that need to go into quarantine. And so there are a lot of nuances in this guidance, but I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that it is available for review on the Department of Education website. You can go to the next slide. Another big piece that we are continuing to emphasize is that children, students, and staff should stay home if they're sick. Department of Education provides a pre-screening tool for all the schools to utilize. Last year, the tool was a little bit more focused on COVID-19 symptoms. This year, they have gone back to more general symptoms around um, being unwell and asking families to keep their children home if they are sick. Not only are we seeing COVID-19 at this point, but as you probably have heard in the South, there's more incidence of what's called respiratory syncytial virus or RSV. They've seen a lot more cases of children be admitted to the hospitals with that. And we're starting to see RSV in the state. So not only is there COVID, there is RSV and we will start to have flu season pretty soon in addition to our normal colds and flus that we see uh, normally in the fall and winter time. So it's really important to make sure that if you're sick, that you stay home. That this doesn't just apply to the schools, it applies to the health systems, it applies to businesses, it applies to all the organizations. Go to the next slide. The Department of Education and DHHS is working um, with schools around testing. Since last November, there has been testing available with what's called a rapid antigen test or Binex now for people who have been symptomatic and they've had concerns about having um, COVID symptoms and wanting to be able to test them in the schools. That's been available. A lot of the schools in the state have Binex now testing. What is new is as of May, the state has made available pool testing for schools. Pool testing is when you have 10 to 25 individuals um, in a school classroom or a school setting. They do an anterior nasal swab, so it's right at the tip of the nose, quick swab. Um, they put each of their swabs into a cup and then it gets sent to the lab. These are a PCR test is done on these and they try to identify if anybody in the pool is positive for COVID. If it's positive, then what they notify the school and no personal information is sent to the testing lab, but they notify the school and then the school will do antigen testing or Binex now testing to identify who the positive person is in the pool. That positive person is then sent home for isolation. Everybody who's negative gets to stay in school. They don't have to quarantine as long as they're participating in the pool testing program. They will get another round of testing done and then they get another test done in the next week with the pool testing. So they're getting tested quite frequently in the school setting. For us, this is really a sentinel event testing. We are trying to pick up cases as quickly as possible and to isolate people as quickly as possible so we can keep kids in-person learning as much as possible. Um, as of the 6th of August, we had about 250 schools enrolled, which is about 80 districts. I think we have almost 300 now at this point. We have been doing pool testing since May with both summer programs, summer schools, summer camps. There's been 198 pools done. One has been positive in the state. And that's fairly consistent with other states experience. Generally, there's a positive pool per 100 pools done. Um, in the groups that are using pool testing right now, we've gotten a pretty positive feedback from those schools. Um, and usually the parent participation, the parents have to opt in for students to be tested. The participation rate's been about 45%, which is good. And I think Massachusetts experience was, is when they first started, um, they had a lower participation rate as the uh, school year went on, more and more families decided to enroll in the pool testing. You go to the next slide. We are also following closely the COVID-19 vaccination rates for both our communities and youth, as well as our school staff. There is vaccine data that's currently available. You can go to the state website and see what the COVID-19 vaccination rate is for youth over the age of 12. It's broken out by 12 to 15 year olds and 15 to 19 year olds. Um, and you can see that by county to kind of see where you are. Um, you go to the next slide. We have about 50% of our youth over the age of 12 that are vaccinated in the state, which is very good. 
but when we look geographically, there are some areas which are very high, over 70 to 80 percent, and then there's some areas where it's very low, less than you know 30 percent. So the Department of Education is working with DHHS to be able to provide the vaccine rates by school administrative unit, and they are hoping to have that done in August. Um, they're cleaning up the data right now, and they're using data both from our state immunizations registry impact, which captures the youth vaccinations, as well as for the denominator, um, both census level data and school administrative unit data. So that should be available soon. That will help us identify where potentially there are some gaps and some schools that might need some help um, either providing school-based um, vaccine clinics or maybe the community would like to do a vaccine clinic, not only for the school, but also for the participants in the surrounding community. You can go to the next slide. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services is also working with Department of Education on school staff reporting uh, vaccine rates. Um, there will be a public dashboard that will be available in September to show the vaccine rates by school administrative unit. This will be similar to the public reporting from the main healthcare worker vaccination dashboard. And you can go to the next slide. So what can you do as a business, as a community, as a healthcare partner? We can work with the schools and school administrative units to help raise their COVID-19 vaccination rates. We did send a survey out to all the school administrative units to find out, are they planning on hosting a COVID-19 vaccine clinic in the future? Are they doing it with their school nurses? Are they doing it with a healthcare partner? from schools who would like to be partnered with the vaccine provider, and others have told us they already have clinics planned with their health care partner. There are also resources available online that the main CDC has put together around COVID-19 vaccine. Um, there are videos um, available as well as print materials and online materials. Uh, we're also encouraging schools to organize community forums with their school leadership and local medical and public health experts to answer questions from families. Additionally, um, for the school nurses, they have what's called a school located vaccine clinic toolkit that has been recently updated with more information around offering COVID-19 to students and staff. You can go to the next slide. Um, as many of you know, there is the routine childhood immunizations uh, law that goes into effect September 1st that um, takes away philosophical and religious exemptions and children will need a medical exemption um, if they're not going to get a vaccine. The rulemaking is still in process for LD-798. There have been draft rules that have been put out for public comment. That public comment period ended at the beginning of August and the main CDC is working on responding to those comments and finalizing the draft rules. So unfortunately, I can't take questions on this because it is in this rulemaking period, but there is a lot of information on the main CDC website. Um, the main immunizations program also sent out to providers um, medical providers information on the new law, and the Department of Education has sent to schools information uh, for families about the law that has been translated into multiple languages and is available online if you would like that information. Go to the next slide. The Department of Education is also working to support schools by um, really ramping up their public health response team. As many of you probably know, they have two school health nurse consultants who have been working very hard with a lot of the schools over the past year. Um, they are now hiring um, Nancy Doobie, who has been one of those school nurse consultants as kind of the team lead for the public health response team. And they're gonna be hiring um, 12 additional positions to support the schools. You may be aware there's nine superintendent regions in the state. Um, so they will have three public health specialists that are sort of the supervisors covering three regions, and then they'll have nine public health liaisons covering each of the superintendent regions. They are ramping this team up right now, and they should be in place in the next couple of weeks to support the schools. Their, their primary focus is really answering questions around COVID-19, helping support the pool testing program, as well as providing support around school-located vaccine clinics. Um, you may also be aware that there has been a school nurse contact tracing team that has been working specifically with the schools to identify um, children and staff that will need to go into isolation and quarantine with positive cases. Um, and so that work continues as well. You can go to the next slide. So finally, I just wanted to end by kind of emphasizing what Dr. Jarvis emphasized in the beginning. Our goal is really to keep kids in-person learning 
this year. Um, we actually in the state had a lot of children in person learning last year, either full time or in a hybrid model. A lot of the schools are going back to school to start the year in person full time. So in order to do that, we need to do the things that we know work. And also, we also need to um, really support the community and the schools in this process. First, we've got to make sure that everybody who is eligible in the school setting is vaccinated, all students and staff, as well as the community that's surrounding them. Last year in the schools, we did not see a lot of spread of COVID within the school building. The, the cases and the quarantine happen through community spread. So it's really important that it, we're not just all focusing on the schools, but we're focusing on the community around it. We recommend masking for all students and staff for the CDC guidance. I think this is a very important step, masking works. And as we talk about the Delta variant, which is much more contagious, this is a really important step for us to put into place and continue throughout the school year. We're also recommending, as we talked about earlier, pool testing for student and staff so that we can pick up the Sentinel cases and isolate people early, as well as rapid antigen testing for symptomatic individuals. Schools should continue to socially distance when possible. I know that's a challenge in some of the buildings, and I know schools are working on ventilation systems, which are all important. And finally, it's just the basics. We've got to practice good hand hygiene. We need to stay home when we're sick. We've really got to support the schools and families right now. So I appreciate everything that you're doing to support uh, your schools, your families, all of your employees um, who have kids in school. Um, this is really our opportunity in the next couple of weeks um, to make sure that we can get kids back in school learning as much as possible. So thank you very much. And I will turn it back over to Dr. Gilkey. Well, thank you, Dr. Belisle. Um, I must say your slide deck is a treasure trove of useful information and links for everyone. So thank you for that as well. So for this next segment, we will hold a round table conversation with our panelists and I will incorporate the questions you place in the Q&A box. While I will direct questions to specific panelists, each panelist is welcome to weigh in on any question. So panelists, please introduce yourself and share with our audience what you have been primarily professor at Hudson University. Mm -hmm. My background is in immunology. I did my PhD studying T cells and the role in the antibody response. Um, but my passion really is education, which is why I'm a professor. And I also do a lot of education with the public. So I do a lot of science communication efforts to make the science around all of these vaccines and COVID in general accessible to all individuals. So I'm really happy to be here today. I'm also a mother myself, so I understand the struggles that parents are trying to navigate at this period of time, and I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Great, thank you. Next is Dr. Belisle. Thank you, Ed. Ed, can you Repeat which part of the question you want me to answer. Sure, sure. So just to reintroduce yourself, if you would, and then and then share with the audience what you're you've been primarily focused on during the pandemic. I mean, lots of moving parts. What's your you know focus? And you can go on video if you care to. Oh, okay, very good. Uh, thank you. So, Blau, I am a pediatrician and I work at DHHS. I'm the child health officer. My primary um, responsibility during COVID has really been trying to connect the healthcare providers working with children with um, information from Department of Health and Human Services, the main CDC and the Department of Education. So really to um, provide information out to healthcare providers about state policies and also to bring back information from the healthcare providers about what's happening in the field and how that could influence our policies at the state level. Um, I've been working a lot in the past several um, months and over the past year with the Department of Education, providing support to them around their COVID-19 response. And the Department of Education also gets a lot of support from the main CDC. They have specific teams working directly with the schools on their public health guidance. So it, it's been a combination of working directly with the medical field, but also with our public health and education colleagues. Great, thanks. Angela Felicia, um, introduce yourself and what you've been primarily focused on during the pandemic. 
Absolutely. Thanks for having me again. And thanks for our wonderful panelists here. I'm Angela Felicia. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. And really, our work here at Acadia's Healthy Life Resources has been focused on all things uh, mental health, wellness, resiliency building through the pandemic. This is certainly something that no one alive has really been through this type of event before. Um, it's caused considerable stress and angst um, and disruption in so many different areas. So we've really been focusing our work in regards to how do we help shore up people's psychological safety, health, and wellness. Great. Well, thanks. And Dr. Jarvis, if you would uh, share your focus as well. Sure. So I'm a family physician by training, but uh, for the last 18 months, uh, my focus has been on leading Northern Light Health COVID-19 response, um, which I thought I was winding down on, but uh, have recently picked up uh, significantly um, the number of hours I spend on that. Um, you know, I guess for me, it, it, it really comes down to my role has been focusing on public safety. You know, what can we do to help protect ourselves uh, from the COVID-19 spread? Um, and uh, and it's my job for our institution to be the one perusing all of the literature as it comes through, trying to assess that data, and then making recommendations, And which is why I love doing this particular webinar. Great. Well, thanks, Jim. We love having you. So um, with those introductions and their areas of primary focus, hopefully that uh, influences the types of questions that uh, you know our audience might want to ask. Um, I'll throw a question out for all of our panelists. What are you most concerned about now as we approach the start of the school year? Dr. Belial? So I think what I'm most concerned about is that there's, we did in the state a pretty good job over the last year limiting the spread of COVID-19 in schools. There were a lot of um, precautions put in place, a lot of mitigation strategies put in place to keep kids in school. With the end of the public health emergency at the end of June, that took away some of the state's ability to mandate things like masks. And so we had to move to recommendations. And so there's just, as noted in the chat, there's been a lot of different local decisions made around COVID-19 mitigation strategies. And so my hope coming here today to talk to you is really to reemphasize what the main CDC and the federal CDC have recommended for schools around making sure people are vaccinated, that they're mm -hmm. masked, and that we have testing um, policies in place, and that we're doing the basics around good hand hygiene and um, making sure that people are staying home when they're sick. These are the things that worked well for us last year, and we are lucky to have vaccinations available for those 12 and up. And my concern is that people uh, potentially are losing focus on the things that work um, and that there's just a lot of different local decisions being made um, that may um, cause us to have more outbreaks and more children not being in-person learning. So I am hoping that people get back to the basics of um, what has worked in the past and what is being recommended as we move forward. Um, and my hope is that you know when some of the plans are being made um, in the late spring, our case numbers were low. As we start to talk about the Delta variant, we see more cases in the state. Things have changed significantly, and I'm hoping that people are able to be flexible and really pivot and really think about things that may need to be in place that they were hoping they didn't have to consider at the end of the spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, points well taken, thank you. Uh, Dr. Marnik, likewise, what are you concerned about now as we approach the start of the school year? And I suspect that the immunologist immunologist in you and the mom in you. Yeah, so I also am worried about um, schools because a lot of schools are choosing not to have masking in schools. And even though the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending universal masking, a lot of schools are choosing not to do that, which is definitely concerning. My my son is not in K through 12. He's only in daycare because um, he's too young. But I still am worried about our community and I'm worried about these kids. And I also feel like pandemic fatigue is really high right now. People enjoy the taste of freedom with not having to wear masks. And now they're confused about why they have to wear masks again. They're confused about boosters. 
And that's concerning to me. But I think the big thing people have to remember is that these recommendations are changing because the science is changing. It's not that we were wrong or that we didn't know things before or that we lied or made things up. It's because Delta is a new variant. It has really changed the landscape about what we knew about COVID-19 previously. And that means we have to update the policies and we have to update the recommendations because as science changes, we have to we have to do that. So it's not that we were wrong before, it's that Delta has really changed the scenario. So I really hope that schools reconsider their masking policies. And I did put my email in the chat. I have a template letter I'm happy to share with anybody who wants to send their school boards about why masking in schools is important and the science behind that. So if people wanna reach out to me for that, I'm happy to share it. Right, and thanks for that, Dr. Marnik. I'm gonna actually uh, interject a question from our part participants uh, for you, Dr. Marnik. Uh, specifically, the question is, should we be worried about other variants as we enter the fall winter months? So I am always worried about more variants because as we have uncontrolled spread, variants will happen because unlike bacteria, viruses can only mutate in a human, in a host. So they have to be infecting an individual to have variants pop up. So our best course of action for preventing variants is to prevent new infections. So the best thing that prevents new infections is vaccination, masking, and distancing. Anything that we have that slows down the number of new infections will slow down the potential for variants. So it is something I'm concerned about, um, but we, we obviously don't know what will happen going forward. So, so let, let, me, let me throw a question from me on that too. So um, I'm preparing for maybe a month from now. Um, we hear about Lambda, and Lambda is the number one variant in dominance in Peru. It's actually found in 29 countries around the world. It's, it's a slight presence in the U.S. at this time. It's considered a, va um, a variant of interest, not a variant of concern, which is a higher degree of uh, concern that the CDC and the World Health Organization has. So what, what are you hearing about Lambda, and how concerned are you at this point? I'm not concerned about Lambda at all. Delta is so much more contagious that it's really becoming the global dominant variant and it's outcompeting Lambda, which means that really it's the Delta variant that we have to worry about now. I don't think Lambda is gonna be an issue, at least as of right now. And that's what a lot of my friends who do um, viral genomics think as well. Awesome. Well, th thank you. You can see that Dr. Marnik is one of my go-to people. <laughs> Great. So, so uh, Dr. Jarvis, would you share for, uh, with us uh, what are you concerned about now? Yeah, in addition to what everybody else has said, I will say that my concern right now is if we continue to see the rate of spread and the rapid increase in hospitalizations, where will we put people if they get sick? And where are we gonna take care of our children? Maine is already hampered by having very few pediatric beds and pediatric specialists across our state. And the last thing we wanna hear is our hospital is closed. I'm sorry, you'll have to go somewhere else. Um, but that's where we're headed if we don't change the direction we're in. And that sounds like a very scary thing for somebody who's a senior health physician to say, but it should be because mm -hmm. that's what we've seen in other states. So many states now have literally had no hospital beds left and are shipping patients out of state. And as we talked about before, you know, time matters when we're talking about acute illnesses and having to do that terrifies me. It's also not what we want. We want people to be closer to home if they need our care. But if we're overwhelmed with COVID cases, that becomes that much harder for us to do. Thanks, Jim. I have a couple questions from our participants that um, you know I think you're pretty well positioned to answer. So I'm gonna throw those in right now, if I may. Um, the first is, do you foresee case numbers in community spread decreasing going into the fall as the number of summer visitors decline? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And I have said that you know one of our issues that we have here in Maine, of course, is our population swells during the summer months. But looking at our, our positivity rates of the last couple of weeks and the way that they are climbing, that means it's in, it's in every aspect of our community. So not just our visitors bringing things in. So unfortunately, I don't see that happening. And in fact, I see the opposite happening. We have universities beginning to start this week and next week. We have uh, uh, primary education also beginning to start, and we still have travel back and forth uh, from, from our visitors and everybody else in Maine. And so, yeah, right now, and the predictive models as we head into fall do not look good. We are in a far worse position right now than we were when the school year started last year, we were, where our positivity rate was somewhere around a half of 1%. 
and way worse than we were in November of last year, just before we saw that skyrocketing rise in hospitalizations. At that time, we were at about 2 sometimes 3%. And like I said, today, somewhere's around 7%. And so that's the concern that I have. Mm. I wish I could be positive. This is going to be one of those you know, days where it, I can't be positive. You know, it's funny. I, I actually say the same thing. Uh, you know, I joke that I am always the, the eternal optimist, but um, we have to be reality-based with uh, COVID-19 for sure. I'm going to just ask you a couple quick questions about uh, the vaccines and boosters, uh, certainly in your wheelhouse here. So, you know, you, we understand that the Pfizer vaccine has certain uh, storage requirements, and maybe you could talk about people who have had the Pfizer that got it at the uh, cross center, for instance, and now would have to travel pretty far to gain access to Pfizer. Could they switch to Moderna or J&J if they're locally available? And then while you're at it, just talk about how do you foresee the booster shots being offered? Would it be anything like the uh, mass centers that we did at the cross center and down in the south as well? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with your first part of your question. We mm-hmm. have made every opportunity to make it avail- all three of the current, currently authorized vaccines available across the entire state of Maine. We have been able to, because we know more uh, the, the, the issues that we had originally with transport and storage of the Pfizer vaccine, some of them have, have lessened as we have learned more. Um, as Dr. Marnick says, we, as we learn more, we change things. So we know that we can keep the, the Pfizer uh, vaccine out of a freezer longer than we thought initially. So we have the ability to get the vaccine wherever it needs to go. So we should be able to accommodate people and not make them have to drive the two, three, four, sometimes five hours that some people did to get a vaccine. Plus, our supply is so much better now, particularly of Pfizer and Moderna. Johnson & Johnson, unfortunately, our supply is, is hampered and limited right now. Uh, but we do have supplies, um, and so, so we should be able to accomplish that. As far as how, we still think it's better with what we're doing right now, because this will not be that large number and bolus of people we're trying to get through, because it should be spread out a little bit more, um, again, partly because we have vaccine available to us and we have more sites. So we think we will be able to accommodate, continue to do what we're doing now, which is being able to provide it in all of our primary care offices, many of our specialty offices, and our retail pharmacies. If and when we, have, we need to be able to stand up something larger, we can do that, and in fact, we are putting plans in place to do so. I do not want to have to go back to a place like the Cross Insurance Center. We will if we have to, but if we can find a way to accommodate closer to home so people don't have to travel, we will, we will do that. So that's where we're at right now, planning stages. Um, we're always a few steps ahead of everybody. Uh, you know, We started planning for this when we started planning for initial vaccines a year ago. Um, obviously, back in December, we were talking about boosters then, and so we kind of, we kind of are pretty good at this right now, um, and I hope that continues. Uh, as we start looking at booster vaccines. Oh, great, thank you. Um, now I'm going to switch to uh, Angela Felicia. Could you share with us what are you concerned about now? Um, and then if you would, in part of your answer, uh, please address the issue about the sort of sense of lack of clarity for masking in schools mm-hmm. and the, the mental health issues that that raises for people. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to do so. I think one of the things um, that I'm most concerned about, and Dr. Marnick raised this issue, is just in terms of pandemic fatigue, um, also this phenomenon of habituation. So um, what ends up happening for folks, too, is we get used to things. So initially, when the pandemic first hit us in early 2020, everything was new and scary and the science was new and scary. So people were quite vigilant. Um, You know, we're into a year and a half plus, um, people have gotten used to things, right? So as that happens, people are getting a little bit more lax. That's a pretty common human response. So that concerns me just in terms of how um, folks are wearing down in terms of any of those mandates and just their ability to keep that level of vigilance up. The challenges um, related to kiddos um, heading back into the school year and having um, different school systems, having different requirements um, is a real challenge for folks. One thing that I think is critically important um, is kids are resilient. Kids have shown great resiliency. And as adults, if we can normalize things like wearing a mask, making that be okay, things like washing your hands, coughing in your elbow, 
that's going to go a long way to helping shore up that resilience for kiddos. In general, though, kids are pretty resilient. And we've seen kids over time really be able to um, adapt probably a little bit better than adults, in fact. That's awesome. Take a, take advantage of their adaptability for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, a- Angela, while, while you're still at the microphone, so to speak, um, let, me, let me ask you a question from one of our participants. Um, do you see a significant number of employees quitting instead of getting their vaccine? So I think that addresses mm-hmm. the healthcare worker mandate and recognizing that you're not in the human resources department uh, yeah. to the extent you feel like you can answer that. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to answer that. You know, what what we've actually seen, in fact, is the majority of our healthcare colleagues are, in fact, vaccinated. Um, You know, we had a great uptick in our Acadia um, entity just in terms of getting vaccines. And really, my healthcare coworkers, colleagues, friends were really interested in being safe (laughs) and protecting the patients and clients that we work with. So the vast majority of the healthcare workers I encounter, in fact, have gotten their vaccine and encouraging their coworkers to get their vaccine. And I'll take it a step further. You know, one of the things we're doing at Northern Light Health is to make sure that, you know, people who are uh, vaccine hesitant, they have every opportunity to have detailed education available to them so that essentially every question they can have uh, can be answered. So that's important Mm -hmm. too. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, take on one of the questions here. Um, Explain, please, is the booster the same vaccine that we received previously or some variation? So the booster that will be available uh, from Pfizer will be the same uh, third dose, if you will, of the formulation that we've had. The same for Moderna, it'll be the uh, third dose, uh, same formulation. J&J is yet to be uh, announced as Dr. Jarvis shared with us. Going forward, um, we may be talking about boosters in a different way. So if you think about as variants develop potentially over the next year, will those variants mutate away from effectiveness of our current um, vaccines? And that may happen. So um, I think we may be seeing some variation on the boosters going forward. The good thing is the technology is such that that's not a very difficult thing for the manufacturers to accommodate to. So uh, Dr. Marnick, uh, that falls into your wheelhouse a bit. You know, what are you seeing? And, and if it's different than my, my explanation, uh, I've learned again. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's possible that we will see um, variant-specific boosters in the future. Uh, right now, those are, like you said, those aren't yet to the table. So the boosters would be the same, the same dose. But they are Pfizer and Moderna are both working on boosters for um, Delta and some other variants. And the preliminary data looks really good um, that those would work really well. But it really is going to depend on what variants pop up because right now. Delta doesn't escape immunity from vaccines completely, and it's hard to predict how this virus could evolve in the future. But like you said, it really is quick and easy to just tweak the vaccines as needed if that does become an issue in the future. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Belial, I have a couple of questions related to school and masking that uh, I'm, I'm going to group together, and I think you might be in a position to help us understand this. So one of the questions is, is there an effort to encourage a statewide mask mandate in schools rather than the piecemeal approach that is currently resulting in many school districts making masks optional? And I think there's a lot of concern I'm picking up on about the optional concept here. So a few things. One, um, the main CDC has worked with the Department of Education and has recommended that people follow the federal CDC guidance and has put that both out by email and their website. They've been talking um, about it for the past month. Dr. Shaw from the Maine CDC held a um, conference call webinar with Department of Education with over 500 school leaders on July 28th to talk through all these recommendations, including masking and to encourage it. 
and Commissioner Macon at the Department of Education meets weekly with the superintendents and school leaders about all of these issues and has talked through them. So I think that the information has gone out, the recommendations have gone out. As you know, it is local control in the state and so there is local variation. Um, but I am hoping and as we start to see the schools in the South go back to school and you'll see in the news, the number of kids going out on quarantine and people reconsidering mask mandates. I'm hoping that that will inform us in the state and will encourage people to adopt a masking policy in the state if they haven't already. Great. Well, I'm going to follow up with a, another question. It goes beyond just the school environment, but the community. But uh, Dr. Belisle, I think you know your position to answer this as well. Um, I'm hearing more and more from frustrated vaccinated people about having to mask up again. The feeling is that they are being inconvenienced to accommodate the bad behavior of others who have chosen not to get vaccinated. Is the masking protecting the vaccinated as well as the unvaccinated? protecting all of us. And I, I know Dr. Jarvison probably, uh, Dr. Marky probably has some things to say about this as well. Um, one of the things that we've seen just in terms, we're talking COVID here, but when, in terms of children, is that we didn't see a lot of different respiratory viruses over the last year when we were masking universally. Um, we were not seeing a lot of RSV, the respiratory syncytial virus. We had very little flu in the state and it was helping to reduce the spread of COVID in the state. As we have taken the masks off, we are seeing more respiratory uh, viruses amongst children. And so it's masks protect all of us. And I think that we're focused on the COVID piece, but it's protecting us against the other viruses as well. So I don't know if Dr. Marnick, do you wanna step in and have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I will echo that masking works. People have it and people think masking is new, but people started masking during the bubonic plague. They learned that it worked then and it's been used as a method of containing pathogens since that time. So we know that masking works. It works best when everybody is masked, but it still offers protection, even if you're just the one wearing a mask because the, um, the, we know that the amount of virus that you're exposed to can dictate if you get sick and how sick you get. So wearing that mask will limit how much virus you're exposed to. It's not 100% effective, but it's another layer that you can add on top of that vaccine to help decrease the likelihood that you'll be a breakthrough infection if you're vaccinated. And for kids, I know I saw in the chat that a mom was asking if the kids would be protected if they're the only ones masking. And again, it's still, it's not as good as if all the kids are masking, but it still will offer them some protection that will decrease their exposure. Yeah, great. Great. So I'll, I'll weigh in on the masking. So, so masking prevents me from passing the virus to others to a large degree, and it pre prevents what virus is in the air from others from getting into me. So it, it actually is a bi-directional protection. Um, and if we have everyone doing it, we really cut down on the transmission. So um, I, have, I have another uh, question here about, um, maybe Dr. Belisle, you can anticipate when do we think we're gonna see vaccines for school-aged children uh, at this point? I have no inside information on this. I think oh, that darn. We, had, I, we had hoped we were going to see Pfizer had said that they were going to submit for their authorization in September with the hope that we would start to see vaccines for the younger age group um, this fall or early winter. I mean, there are just a lot of there's a lot of speculation out there whether or not that's going to happen or whether or not we're going to be seeing a later time period. Um, Moderna had to was asked to reopen and include more children in their trials. They have trials for the um, two to five and then the five to 12 year olds. And so it is not clear to us when vaccine is going to be available. I think that we're hoping it's late fall, early winter, but we don't know. So it, unfortunately, I think that's hard. I've got two children that are unvaccinated because they're under the age of 12 and two that are over the age of 12 that are vaccinated. It's really hard on families. I think th this is stressful and, and makes it hard for families to do normal activities and travel and things like that. Um, but we just, we just don't know yet. 
Yeah, so, th so that question will remain on our radar screen as we move forward through this webinar series. You know, I, I know Dr. Jarvis is uh, paying a great deal of attention to that, as am I. Um, Dr. Jarvis, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. So are you anticipating that uh, when people get the booster, the sim symptoms that they get uh, on that second vaccine dose is going to be fairly similar? Yeah, that's hard to say. So yeah, you know, overall, I could say yes, globally, that's the way we'll look at things. Um, but everybody's so different. And we found that many people had a very different response to their first shot than their second shot. We had people who said their first shot was worse than their second shot. We know that most people said that the second shot was worse than the first one, which kind of made sense from an immunologic standpoint. But I'll tell you, with COVID, I expect everything and anything. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so really my concern is if, if with one of your first or second doses, you had some kind of, of reaction that a medical person had to intervene with, then make sure that, that you alert your medical personnel when you're going to get your third, when you're going to get your third dose so that maybe we can pre-medicate you or at least watch you a little bit more closely. But if we're talking about the, the sore arm, the not feeling well, the fatigue, the headache kind of things that a lot of people experience, yeah, there's not a whole lot we can do that to prevent that from happening again. And I can't tell you whether or not it's going to happen. Each individual had it happen to them before. It's always a little bit different when we're talking about the immune system. Excellent. Um, can you mention also, you know, considering that we're getting a third dose, um, how will that uh, help with Delta? Yeah. So, so first and foremost, as Dr. Marnik already stated, the three currently approved vaccine or authorized vaccines in the United States give us great coverage against Delta. Okay. We've been seeing that. Uh, the UK uh, told us that because they saw it a whole lot before we did. The rest of Europe followed shortly behind that. And of course, we just see that here in the United States. The reason why Delta variant is spreading so rapidly isn't because the vaccines aren't working. It's because we still have so many people who are unvaccinated, including, unfortunately, our children who can't be vaccinated. And they are now becoming a vector spreading the disease to adults who are unvaccinated. We, we do see breakthrough cases. And there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One, the much more infectious uh, activity of the Delta virus. And two, some of us have been vaccinated now for well over eight months, and we knew that, that immunity was going to wane, so it's just out there. And then, of course, we still have that population of people who are immunocompromised, where despite even being vaccinated, they may not be able to uh, have a, an appropriate immune response to fight off Delta. So those are the factors that are kind of what we're dealing with now. Again, I still, I'm optimistic. I still hope that there'll be a shift in, in the way we talk about vaccines in this country and that we'll see more people get vaccinated, particularly because they don't want to wind up like their family members did in hospitals or unfortunately dying. And so uh, if we heed that call, we can stem this. Um, and so that's where, where really we should be focusing in on right now. So with only, thank you very much. So with only a couple of minutes uh, left here, um, there, there's a question about Masking is optional in school and distancing isn't happening. How can I protect my children who will be masked when it comes to unmasked times like snack and lunch? So, you know, I think, I think this is the answer to this question is really good common sense application and talking with your children, helping them to understand what that means. So to the degree that we can keep people masked, keep people, you know, socially distanced, which we appreciate is really about six feet or more, uh, not really three feet, which is, you know, cutting the corners, if you will. To whatever degree we can instill that, the protection goes up. So now I have a question here for Angela. Um, are there any adverse effects from children wearing masks all day in school? That's a great question. Um, Certainly, I won't speak to any science related to that, but in terms of mental health, absolutely not, none. <laughs> um, kids are resilient. Kids get used to what becomes normal. So there's absolutely no psychological adverse impact to kiddos wearing a mask all day, or frankly, adults wearing a mask all day. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So we find ourselves at the uh, tail end of our hour, and uh, certainly, once again, we could go on for another whole hour. So we appreciate our panelists and all their knowledge. Um, we've included some tools for you at the end of this presentation. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to our panelists. Our, I hope this hour has been a help to support you, your employees, and our communities to safely manage through this pandemic. Just a reminder, we will be emailing you a survey right after our conference. Please be sure to give us your feedback so we can continue to provide relevant information. Our next session will be on September 16th. Our theme for this session will be mental health and living through COVID-19. We'll give, we'll give updates on the virus, 
keeping everyone safe and vaccines. We'll also devote considerable time to many aspects of mental health across all age groups. I think we are recognizing that our long awaited summer freedoms are being curtailed and the toll this may take on everyone is emerging. There's a lot to deal with. Thinking and learning together is part of the solution. We will send you the link for this session. We encourage you to share the invitation with your friends, colleagues, and others who might benefit from the information. By working together to promote good health, we will be promoting good business. Thank you and have a good afternoon.